Good morning. Okay, you can do better than that. I'm sure of it. Good morning. There we go. I'd say who, but I'm not an army guy. I'm an air force guy. And that would just be disingenuous. Okay. So first question, uh, and I'm kind of hiding behind the podium, although I'm not trying to, is everyone suitably impressed the lawyers wearing a suit? Okay. Y'all let me explain. I come from a Southern Baptist tradition. If you don't give me feedback, I'll just keep repeating myself. So is everyone suitably impressed? Wait a second, partner, with the photo of the camera there. I want to make sure the tie is straight, okay? Everybody impressed the lawyers wearing a suit? No. No? No. You just got a discount on your first retainer. Um, okay, so here's the deal. What you need to know about me, because I'm not being introduced this morning, because June, uh, June Marshall had to stay in San Francisco this week and is not able to join us here. So there is going, there's not going to be any introduction. So I'm going to introduce myself and this is going to be really long and laborsome, not I'm Hawk. And I spent the first, is this too loud? It seems too loud to me. Is this too loud? Are you sure? Okay. You're actually telling a lawyer to not turn it down. Seriously. Really? Um, so I'm Hawk and I spent the first half of my adult life wearing a flight suit, not a business suit. So this feels more like a costume than a uniform. Um, but I'm doing my best to rock it out for you. And the first question I have for you is, do you know the difference between a federal contracts lawyer in DC and one in Denver? Because we have offices in both places. You know what the difference is? They're right there. And for those of you who can't see, they're right there. All right. So I got a little DC going up here and a little Denver going down there. Cause I kind of grew up on the South end of Dallas and I'm trying to find my way in the world. Anyway, I'm Hawk. Um, let me give you my first disclaimer. I got an email at seven o'clock this morning from the SAME staff that said, um, we reworked your slides. Isn't that special? And it was like, well, lucky me. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what we're going to see up here. Hopefully they at least kept the right content, but we'll wing it. So good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, I kind of question your judgment about why you'd come see a lawyer at 1045 in the morning when the only thing standing between you and lunch is me. But I'll tell you this, I will endeavor to make this fun. We're going to learn, but we're going to have fun because if we're not having fun. You're not going to learn anything. I've learned that, that if people are asleep, they don't learn. Now, let me advise all of you because I am a, you know, I have three teenagers, God bless my soul. Um, and I, I know we all are electronically wired. So let me just tell you this. If you have your, your apple, your blackberry, your blueberry, or whatever it is you have, and it isn't Jesus calling, don't answer it. Cause I will call you out. How many of you have seen me speak before? And you came back, bless your hearts. Uh, they will tell you, I will do that. So now I will tell you though, I, I, I got one, we got to move this for now. I will be tripping over that the whole time. Being an old aviator, I, I don't do well behind podiums. I walk and talk and do this bit. Um, I did have a lady at a session and we'll just, we'll just choose you, ma'am, since you're right here in handy. Um, and by the way, if you get picked on the session, you know, don't take it personal. So she was just she was going at it. I mean, she was just texting her brains out in the middle of my session and I saw her. So I walked over and I said, ma'am, really? After the warning I gave and you're texting, she looks up at me. Doesn't miss a beat. Come on in y'all. Come on in. She looks up at me, doesn't miss a beat and says, I'm taking notes. <laughs> it was the most bold faced lie I've ever heard in my life, <laughs> but it was so good. And I bought her a drink later. I mean, it's just, it's the thing to do, right? So in any event, seriously though, you don't have to photograph the slides. If you don't already know, they will be available in a um, non-manipulable format after the conference, but have a good time. Uh, we're going to try to have some time for questions at the end. I will tell you, I'm notorious about trying to pack an hour and a half into 45 minutes. So hopefully we'll balance that out a bit today. But what I want you to know up front are two things. First of all, at the end of the session, I would be grateful. I've got three things up here for you. I've got a business card. Boop. I've got a little capabilities, whatever you call these things. And here's the best part. This is an eight gigabyte flash drive. That's the size of a credit card fits in your wallet. You just flip the tab and plug it into your laptop. There's nothing on it. There's no advertising, anything like that. 
but take this, keep it, enjoy it. I think this is just the cat's ass, and so I had a bunch of them made for this conference. So, well, my best friend calls it, you know, the cat's meow just sounds kind of limp, so he calls it the cat's ass. I, I can't take credit for that one. And even they're on both sides here. Please leave your business card. I promise I will not inundate you. The only thing that's going to happen is I'll reach out to you on LinkedIn. Fair enough? Okay. Fair enough? Yes, sir. I'm telling you, you got to get with the program. It's going to be a long morning. Oh, thank you. See, I asked these guys to hold me accountable. The best part is that at what time's the happy hour this in the exhibit hall this afternoon? Four or five, something like that. Read Law. That's that's us. Read Law is sponsoring the bar at Bourbon Street. You know the Bourbon Street exhibit, 1057, the big tall banners, open street complex. Everybody, yes, no? Okay, yes. get there this afternoon, drinks are on us, and, uh, and you can bring your friends to collect their own flash drives so they don't steal yours. How's that, good? good. All right, let's get rocking it out because they always complain that we don't get enough in. Okay, and I'm advancing, I'm advancing. I'm not advancing, what's going on? Oh, okay, please take note of the exits. Uh, this is gonna be a long morning if this thing's not working. Where's Don? Right here. Oh, there's Don. Don, I'm, I'm flipping and it's not doing anything. They had timings on them? Well, that's gonna be a problem. Okay, there's the thank you. Okay, it's working. Wow, I, these are not my charts. This is the part they changed on you. Okay, here we go. All right, this is my chart. All right, I normally have it considered an anathema for attendees to read my charts because I want you listening, not reading, and presumably all of you can do both. If you can't, you should leave now because this really isn't the right place for you. But I want you to read this one because I want to point out some things. This is our premise. And there are three things I want you to note about this. Misapplied and poorly executed. Blah, 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 blah. Must what? Three things. Pass muster with contracting officers, withstand challenge by industry competitors, and deliver exemplary contract performance while steering clear of the courthouse. I know it's shocking to you as a lawyer for me to say this, but I really don't want to take you into court. It's a marvelous business opportunity for me. We make a ton of money doing litigation. But what I really want is to get a little bit of your money up front and along the way so that you can go to great success while mitigating all the risks associated with this business to stay out of court. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have about three people in here who get it and the rest of you are like bumps on a log. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Excellent, good. And by the way, there is a small business focus this morning because we are after all at the small business conference, but don't worry, I know this is gonna weigh heavy on the hearts of all you small businesses, but the multi-billion dollar guys, they'll be all right, okay? Um, and I'm going to pick on big business today, but I want you to know I'm not anti big business. In fact, I had a lovely dinner with a client last night who was entertaining a large business. Great guys, and uh, not just individually, but as a corporation, as an entity, they're a good group. They want to help small business. They want to engage SDVOSBs to help them do what they do in the federal market. They're good guys, but unfortunately, they're the exception, not the rule. This is Robbie. Robbie could be Lockheed, Bechtel. And by the way, if you're from Lockheed or Bechtel, I'm not picking on you, I'm just using it as an example. This is unfortunately how many large businesses view small business. And if you get burned because you, the process, I'll just say the process got screwed up, not that they screwed you per se, or that you screwed up, but something along the way went south and it all goes bad when you get fried because it's you that gets fried. Notice Robbie is in no fear of being burned and neither is any large business you work with. They are in no fear of getting burned because if something goes south, they are going to toss you aside and go get a pull out another ant. How many of you can embrace or are familiar with that experience. 
Okay, this is one of those moments where I get a big amen. amen. Okay, so it is true. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to tell you the way it is, which leads us to our next chart. This is not a FAR 101 intro to teaming presentation. If you're looking for the basics of teaming, go call your local PTAC. They've got a marvelous course on that. They can teach you everything you need to know. As much as it thrills me, and I mean it truly as a lawyer, titillates me to drill down into the nuances of the FAR and cite every provision and then twist it in front of a judge, that's not what we're here to do this morning. We are here to take an advanced course on relationships, business relationships in the context of federal contracting. Are you good for that? Yes. Okay. So this is what we're trying to accomplish. So at the end of the day, you can grade me on whether or not I helped you do these things, which is to figure out whether or not a prospective alliance, and you're going to hear me use that term all the time, not necessarily teaming, not necessarily joint venture, not necessarily prime sub, not necessarily mentor protege, although those are all types, but alliances, a relationship. And you got to figure out whether it's right for you, whether it's right for them, whether it's right for the customer, or it's right for everybody or maybe nobody. You need to understand how these maddening sea of conflicting regulations, and if you're a veteran-owned small business, you know exactly what I'm talking about between the SBA and the VA. And by the way, that problem has not been solved yet. Um, as usual, we had legislative change that made things even crazier than simpler. Folks, come on in. Um, we need to talk about, I hate to tell you this, but how to paper things. Because we lawyers, we memorialize, memorialize, memorialize. By the way, any other lawyers in the room? Well, lucky you, you only got stuck with one today. <laughs> um, and then lastly, the bottom line, which is, oh yeah, we we'll go back to that first chart. What, what's the key word in this whole presentation? Winning. Winning. Yeah, if you didn't figure that out and I had the pointer on it, you're really not bright enough to be here. You should think again. Okay, about winning. All right. Um, and by the way, I do have an hour to an hour and a half on a dozen different federal contracting topics, one of which is pre and post award protests. Happy to send you those charts if you're interested. Okay. Read the bottom line first. Because it's true. If you don't remember anything else in the hour we spend together, remember this. Because that's the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. An opportunity is tactical, a relationship is strategic, and a winning alliance forges both. And a winning alliance starts with vetting. That's where everyone in this room should give me a big amen. amen. Especially all of you who had a less than ideal alliance. Anybody in this room had a less than ideal alliance? Raise your hand. Well, that's quite a few. And if you didn't raise your hand, turn to whoever was close to you that did and say, bless your heart, I'm glad I'm not you. <laughs> the whole idea, folks, is for that not to happen to you. And we're gonna talk about how to get there. Okay, so basic structures. And there are three. There's the prime sub relationship, there's the joint venture relationship, and there's the mentor protege relationship. And this is about as dull as this presentation is gonna get in terms of drilling down on the FAR, but we're really not gonna go line and verse. But there are a few things I wanna tell you. First of all, I get asked all the time, I get calls in my office all the time, I get emails from prospective clients all the time about, hey, we wanna do a joint venture. Hey, we're thinking about being in a mentor protege relationship. And my first question is, why? Why would you do that? There's nothing wrong with being in a joint venture. There's nothing wrong with mentor protege relationships, but there's a lot to them. And so the first thing I want you to think about is that there's lots of ways to skin the cat if you need to do business with somebody else. And 90% of the time, it's not gonna be one of those solutions because those solutions are more costly, they are more burdensome, they are more difficult to sustain, and here's the big punchline, they're a lot easier to screw up and to get screwed. Second, affiliation. What I call the big tail wagging the small dog. And if you don't understand what that means, the big tail wagging the small dog, you need to think again about being in this business because it should be intuitively obvious to all of you what I'm talking about in terms of big business and small business. 
too much of the big tail wagging the small dog. And don't think that your competitors who hire people like me to get you out of their way. And let me just be completely candid about this. We do lots of things for large business, mid-size, mid-tier, and small business of every stripe around the country, around the world, in every industry sector, okay? We have a small business client that rents porta potties to the federal government. And if I had to do it all again, I'd have taken the 150 grand I put into law school and I'd have bought porta potties. Because <laughs> at 34, no, last year was 42 million unit nights per year and 45 bucks a night, that's a lot of tacos, okay? But in any event, my point is in that, that all too often the big tail wags the small, tail, the small dog and that's not good for anybody. Also, let's remember limitations on subcontracting, okay? That's an SBA rule. It says if you're in the services business, you have to self-perform at least 50%. If you're in specialty construction, it's 75. If you're in general construction, it's 85, or excuse me, 25 and 15. The point is you have to self-perform and there's ways to do that and, oh, nope, 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 nope. Nope, that's what I want. There you go. Similarly situated entities. It's the best thing since sliced bread if you're a small business federal contractor. And what that is, is there a, was a law, a change in the rules a couple years ago that said, if you're an SDVOSB and you're an SDVOSB and you're an SDVOSB, or, and you can use all these terms interchangeably for purposes of our conversation this morning, SDVOSB, woman owned, 8A, pick your flavor. Okay, they're all in my world called SBA participant entities. But if you're all three, that same thing, you can all band together to perform a contract. And it doesn't matter if he's the prime, he's the prime, or she's the prime, because you're all SDVUSB on, an S on a small business set aside contract, your collective efforts count toward that self-performance. That is the coolest thing ever. It is the greatest leap forward we've taken in federal contract law for small businesses in 20 years. If you haven't figured out that one, you need to get on that. You need to find similarly situated entities to go out and perform. Because I will tell you this, there, and we're gonna talk about the pluses and you know, kind of the puts and takes and pros and cons of relationships and, and alliances. Small businesses sometimes are less reliable, but the chances of you getting hosed goes way down. I would much rather see a small business client align with other small businesses to perform a contract than to get into bed with a large business to do the same thing. Okay, you can pull your bonding power, you can do all kinds of things. And you've got a green light to do it by regulation. That is just the greatest thing. Joint ventures. Okay, first of all, you need to have a good reason to do a joint venture. If you don't have a specific good reason, getting into a joint venture or mentor protege relationship to me is a lot like getting married. There's nothing wrong with it, but you ought to have a good reason for doing it because it's a hell of a commitment, right? Yes. It, it, I, nobody in here been married before? <laughs> I, I've been there, done that, lost the t-shirt in the process and don't ever want to do it again. But my point is, I've got three teenagers who I tell marriage is a good thing um, if you marry the right person, which unfortunately their father didn't, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, <laughs> bless her heart. And I mean that in a Southern way for all of you from this part of the country. Um, so, but my point is it is a commitment. You are literally putting your life into someone else's hands. And so if you're gonna do it, there should be a reason. And truly the two most prominent reasons for that is because there's a locality requirement that says the prime has to be, let's say within a hundred miles of the location for the work. And Aaron here is on the other side of the country, but turn it around. Robert lives next door. And we'll just say they're similarly situated to make it even easier, okay? The point is, Aaron has the capability, Robert really doesn't, although he could add to it, but Robert's local, together they make a great team, but they can't prime sub because the prime has to be within 100 miles of the job site, so they want to do a joint venture to satisfy that locality requirement. Or, likewise, Aaron's the right guy for the job, but Robert's got the past performance history. 
And the solicitation expresses that past performance for primary subs will not be credited in the evaluation process. So therefore, if they're a joint venture, then Aaron gets the benefit of Robert's past performance. Okay, so those are two great reasons to do it, but understand it's a short-term arrangement. By regulation, a joint venture in the small business realm can only win three contracts in two years. Now, for some of you, well, we'll talk about that. For purposes of our conversation this morning, it's, we're gonna go with it. I, I, I understand, I know what you're talking about, but for purposes of our conversation this morning, what informs this is still that idea that it is a short-term relationship. It has limited utility. But more importantly is getting it done. Because depending on the nature of the contract, that joint venture has to be approved. And if it's on the SDB, SB, SDB OSB or VOSB side with the VA, CBE is going to have to accredit that, certify, as they say, that relationship, that joint venture as an entity, just like your SDB OSB or VOSB has to be verified, okay? So there's approval processes, but here's the real kicker. If you're gonna do it properly, you don't sign just a joint venture agreement. You create an entity. And it's just like creating your business. You form an entity, you file articles of, organiz or articles of incorporation or articles of organization. You need to have an operating agreement almost by every statute, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. It's gonna require an operating agreement because it's not a single member, single member LLC or there's more than one shareholder. You're gonna to have to walk through, and in some cases it's statutory, how much, uh, how profits get split and what the ownership percentage is. You have to have separate bank accounts, you have to have separate accounting. It's a lot. Now, I'm not telling you it's a bad thing to do, but if all of that doesn't sound like a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of headache, a lot of sustainment, and a lot of legal fees, you're right, it is, okay? Again, not anti-joint venture, but if you can do it without a JV, why wouldn't you? Likewise, Minter Protege. I, we're not gonna drill down into Minter Protege other than to say you all may be aware that for the longest time there was Minter Protege relationships apart from it within the Department of Defense, Minter Protege relationships were limited to 8A entities. That's all changed. And the 8A Minter Protege program may actually go away in its entirety because it's gonna be subsumed by the all small Minter Protege relationship and provision in that program. With that said, great shoes, I love those. Um, with all that said, Minter Protege is a double-edged sword. It can open the door to an opportunity for you as a small business to grow in concert with a larger sponsor, okay? Again, hear me loud and clear, I'm not anti minor Protégé, but here's what I will tell you as a matter of experience. Nine out, y'all, are you standing up because you need the exercise? Come, no, no, come on in here. Folks, can we just, if you're on the end, can you slide down and make room for these folks? Let's be, bless their hearts, give them a chance to take a seat. Um, that, that way they're more likely to fall asleep than you. And, and we have, as you would imagine, just like in church, there's plenty of room down front. Um, nine out of 10, if not 99 out of 100 men or protege agreements I've read in my career have enormously, and I mean enormously, disproportionately favored who? Yeah, favored the mentor, not the protege. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because almost invariably the mentor drafts that agreement. And the great misperception among small business is that the SBA is looking out for you. Now, it, do we have anybody here from the SBA? Because I get a big amen from them on this. No, oh, that's unfortunate. I'm not dissing on the SBA. The SBA is a great organization. But the SBA has a customer. You know who that customer is? The federal government, not you. They are acting on your behalf in duty to the federal government. If you want someone to protect you, to look out for your interests and to advocate for you, whether it's in drafting a minor protege agreement or anything else, and if you don't like me, that's fine. I'll refer you to one of my competitors who actually know what they're doing. But, 
My point is, you need me or somebody like me. Because the SBA's job, when they get a mentor protege agreement for approval, is to make sure that all the boxes are checked. That's it. They're not there to ensure, I've got some guys, great, get one over, you must have been through this process. They're doing what they're supposed to do, but their customer, their client is the government, it is not your business. And they, they look, they're like, do we have any contracting officers in here? Well, that's too bad. They like that too, because I always put my boot up your butt and they enjoy that because they can't do it. <laughs> they're like all other guys. They got this much to do and this much time to do it in. Okay, so they're, they're checking through the boxes and if it looks okay, boom, it's gonna get approved. That doesn't mean your interests are protected. That just means it checks the boxes. But I'm telling you that almost invariably, it's not a good thing oh, down here. There we go. But more importantly is this. Everybody presumes that the mentor protege agreement is going to be what? Because the large entity, the mentor can purchase up to, what's the number? 40% of that protege. Do you know you can have a mentor protege agreement in place without any equity involved? It's not a given. Most small businesses don't get that. They just believe when they're approached by a mentor, okay? So Dick here wants to be in a mentor protege relationship. And because he's an SDVOSB and an 8A or whatever he is, um, Damon here, man, he's all over it. Damon's, you know, multi-billion dollar company. He wants, what does he want? What does Damon want from Dick? Right, he wants a big A word, and I don't mean a, uh, access. He wants access to those small business set aside contracts, right? So he's gonna say, well, Dick, no problem. I'll be happy to be your mentor, and we'll take 40, you know, just doing the normal thing, right? We're gonna take 40% of your equity. Dick's, okay, because that's just the way it's done. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Every single aspect of a mentor protege relationship is entirely negotiable, whether it's equity, whether it's equipment, whether it's bonding assistance, whatever it is, it's all negotiable. But 99% of small businesses don't negotiate anything. They simply allow a mentor to roll in with their agreement and they sign on the dotted line. But, and there's a ton of rules in, the, in 13 CFR. Um, sections 121 to 125, if anyone's interested, or actually through 134 about this. But, and people, small businesses particularly, find them cumbersome and annoying and frustrating and everything else. But here's what I'll tell you. They're there to protect you. Because it really is, when you're a small business owner, and I, I'm presuming the majority of you are small business, yes? Yes. Okay. You're not Lockmart. It's your name. It's your social security number. It's your reputation. It's your livelihood. It's all yours that's on the line. And if it doesn't go well, you're the one who's gonna pay the price for it. You have the least to gain and the most to lose in any relationship. Think about that. Man, we'll take questions at the end if we have time. And if not, I'll be here as long as you wanna be. I don't need to eat. You can come up and talk to me all day long. But I want you to remember this, you've got to paper whatever you're doing. As we lawyers say, memorialize, document, you have to have a compelling paper trail. And here's the reason. Right there. Because you bear the burden. This is not civil litigation. Where if someone makes an accusation against you, they have to prove it. All I have to do, because I work for your competitors, all I have to do is put a scintilla of evidence in front of an agency contracting officer, the SBA, the VA, or whoever's in play. Just a scintilla. All I gotta do is give them a nugget that something is amiss and the government will do all the dirty work for me because they will suspend the procurement, suspend you as a small business until the investigation is complete. Has anyone in here gone through an SBA open review? 
Oh, that's too bad, because I'd love to get a testimonial. <laughs> it's horrifying. And everything about your business gets laid bare when you get challenged. Oh, and, and by the way, it won't be the contracting officers who, can, who challenge you. There's your problem. It's not the contracting officers, they're there to help. It's your competitors, because your competitors want you gone and they hire people like me to make it happen for them. And to be honest with most of you, it's just not that hard to do. You put your dirty laundry out on your websites in spades. You think you're bragging about how amazing you are. What I see are indicators of affiliation and all I have to do is start peeling it back and I can put enough in front of a contracting officer in front of OHA to, to have them do an investigation. And when that happens, by the way, and now you're under review, uh, that contracting officer still has a job to do, right? So what happens to that procurement? What happens to it? It goes to somebody else. That's what happens to it. That's exactly right, because the government has a mission to accomplish. So let's move on. So we talked about these different structures. Let's talk about the agreements, about how to paper the process. This is where it starts getting fun again, by the way. I know that last one was like kind of dull and, and, and uh, extended, but non-disclosure agreements. Oh no, I misspoke. Mutual non-disclosure agreements. Let me tell you what, and again, I don't make any of this stuff up. I'm like Jeff Foxworthy. I don't make it up, I just write it down, right? I do this for a living, day in and day out. Here's what happens. It's very exciting. Here's what happens. All right. I know you're taking notes and not texting, so you're good, sir, David. See, that's how intently he's taking notes. He didn't even notice I was here. So David and Linda, all right? David and Linda say, now, Linda's the big business, David's a small business. And Linda says, David, I think you're amazing. I think you're wonderful. And she flatters and flatters and flatters because she wants, what's the big A word? Access, come on, say it with me, access. And so she flatters David. You know the first thing David does? Well, he tells her everything. He sends her everything, including his rate structure and his overhead. And I mean the whole bit. He's a <laughs> Linda, let me show you everything. Okay, back in the non-PC days, we call that dropping your drawers. All right, that's what he does. And then Linda says, well, thank you so much for that, David. And then she takes that information and she uses it to underbid him with some other small business. That's what happens. So my only punchline to you on non-disclosure agreements is that they need to be mutual and timing, 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 meaning this is the first thing you ought to be doing. You don't tell anybody anything over a drink, a dinner, or an initial meeting of any consequence whatsoever. And I'm not saying to be a jerk about it. I'm just saying, you know what's protected information and what's not. You don't disclose protected information until there is a mutual non-disclosure agreement in place. Amen? Amen? Good. Teaming agreements. These are literally, I'm not giving you a course on these. These are literally my like top 10 list things that you need to remember. Teaming agreements. First and foremost, there is a line of demarcation. Follow the pointer, okay? Here's what we're gonna say. Here's the line of demarcation. Up to this point, you're bidding on a contract. At this point, you're performing a contract. This would be what we call contract award. Teaming agreements should never contemplate or bind the parties in this space. A teaming agreement is designed to control, to govern, to inform the conduct of the parties in this space. One of those nine out of 10 deals, large business will send you a teaming agreement that obligates you over here, but not them. Well, that's handy, isn't it? No one should be obligated over here at all. This is what are we gonna do for each other in this space? When we get over here, that's why we have a subcontract agreement to govern the performance of the parties executing on the contract, okay? That's one of those, if you don't remember anything else, remember the contract line demarcation. And then there's issues of whether it's unilateral or it's mutual, whether it's exclusive or it's non-exclusive. Here's my bid on all that. If it's not exclusive, it better damn well not be exclusive for both of you. And once again, almost always, it is. They're, you're bound to them, but they're not bound to you. We're gonna tell you how to solve all these problems here in about five minutes. Subcontract agreements. 
Uh, just a quick tip, uh, take your statement of work and your payment strategy, however the payments are gonna be paid, the methodology for doing so, the timing of doing so, the amounts, blah, 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 blah. Put all that stuff in exhibits. Don't clutter your main contract with it. Keep the agreement simple and straight line, straightforward, which, oh, by the way, a good subcontract agreement in the federal market should be at least 30 and probably, and could go upwards from there. I like to keep under 100 pages, but if you've got a five-page subcontract agreement, you need to think about a new subcontract agreement, okay? Because it should be substantive, particularly in the A, E, and C world. Absolutely, hands down. I've never put one out that was less than 40 pages, and that was as streamlined as we could make it. And I'm not about flowering up anything. Um, the ostensible subcontractor. Oh, there we go again. We're back to the big, small thing. Christopher Holloman is the chief administrative judge in the SBA. He is a former army officer. He is a prince of a guy. I know he and his wife. I've been in their home. He's a lovely man. He is brutal on the lawyers who appear before him. I know that from firsthand experience. Okay, and he is truly a prince of a guy. I mean that genuinely. Uh, judge Holloman is a great guy. But I will tell you from being in front of Judge Hallman, when he's trying to figure out whether or not there's an ostensible subcontractor, and for those of you who don't know what an ostensible subcontractor is, that's where the big tail's wagging the small dog, all right? That, that you won't find that definition in the FAR, but it's a lot more effective than what they, how they describe it in the FAR, okay? And you know what the first piece of evidence and the most compelling piece of evidence that Judge Hallman wants to see when I'm arguing for some poor schmuck small business who screwed it up that, oh, big business really isn't the ostensible subcontractor here. You know what he wants to see? He wants to see two pieces of paper. He wants to see the prime contract statement of work and he wants to see the subcontract statement of work. And the more they align, the more likely it is you have an ostensible subcontractor, okay? Because what he's gonna look at is, yeah, you're really not doing the work. They're doing the work. And because they're doing the work, they are an ostensible subcontractor. Therefore, you're affiliated. Therefore, you're no longer small. Therefore, boop, you're out. And you lose the contract and it goes to somebody else, okay? Joint venture agreements. Um, again, we talked about having approval from the VA or uh, the SBA, depending on the nature of the joint venture agreement, we're not gonna drill down on all those specificities today. Um, those adventures, those joint venture agreements, a joint venture agreement is a fine tool. You don't sign a joint venture agreement and now you're in a joint venture. If you do, you're dumb, okay? You sign a joint venture agreement between Arnold and JJ as a well, I'd say it's a starting point, but there's something that comes before a joint venture agreement. What would that be? Say it. A mutual NDA, not an NDA, a mutual NDA, right? But then they get the joint venture agreement. That's an agreement that says, he, that governs the relationship within the context of joint venture. That doesn't create a joint venture. That creates obligations and duties of performance in a joint venture the joint venture is created when you form the entity. And if you don't form an entity, you're a moron because you will get hurt doing that. Okay. It will screw with your, it'll screw with everything. I can't even do, begin to drill down on all that today, but that doesn't form the entity. You still have to form the entity. And like with most of these things, that's not something I recommend you try at home. Minoprogy agreements. Here's let me tell you about minoprogy agreements. The most important thing you need to know about them, other than things we already talked about, is that they are prescriptive by nature. The SBA rules specify in detail, in excruciating detail, what has to be a part of a Minoproje agreement, okay? And again, that's great, I can tell you. I don't know a lawyer in this business who doesn't have that canned template in their practice files. That's not what you should be signing. Let's not let another tail wag the dog. Let's not put the cart in front of the horse and let the agreement dictate the relationship. The relationship dictates the agreement, not the other way around. Figure out how you wanna to work together and all the thousand questions that have to be answered, then from there, develop the agreement. Good? Good. Yes. Most important, let's read the bottom. 
Now look, your small businesses, and I know from experience, that you are lawyer adverse. <laughs> I'll put a finer point on it. You're cheap asses. <laughs> and if you have a lawyer at all, it's likely your sister-in-law's cousin who's a family lawyer in Des Moines, okay, who crafted your articles of incorporation or your theming agreements or whatever. But most of you, you just downloaded it off of Google and made a little word, did a few wordsmith changes and think that you now have a proper legal document. You don't. Okay, and I've made a lot of money over the last 10 years unwinding your stupidity when you do that. Okay, and by the way, you can rank this presentation any way you want and talk about how wonderfully insulting I was. They'll still invite me back because it's all true. Okay, and I'm not trying to be insulting with you at all. I'm trying to help you not do things that are dumb, not do things that are moronic, not do things that are stupid because you don't have to, you have a better way. And that's what this whole session is about, is helping you find a better way. And, and she's leaving so clearly I have offended her. Um, oh, good, oh, good. Don't, we don't wanna miss the best part without you. Um, so don't do that, okay? I could fill this room, I could fill that exhibit hall with clients who would tell you, they learned the hard way that they did ready, fire, aim. They spent a lot of money and we made a lot of money. And I'm thankful for that because I have three teenagers, okay? Three college age teenagers, two of whom are in South America right now, which is why dad's in New Orleans and not in South America right now. Um, I cannot underscore an ounce of prevention in this business is worth 10 megatons of cure. It's so easy and so inexpensive to do it right up front. And it is so painful and so costly to not. Because this is not what you're good at. This is what I'm good at. You know what I'm not good at? I'm not good at capturing and executing on A, E, and C federal contracts. That's not what I do, but that's supposed to be what you do. That's supposed to be what you're good at. So take a piece of advice from somebody who's been doing this for a long time and has been in the federal market around contractors in every capacity for 30 plus years. As I wasn't a lawyer in my first life, I did flight test and weapons development, but I've worked with contractors as an engineer, as a project manager, as a program director, as a group commander, as the chief technology officer for US Joint Forces Command. I worked with contractors all my life. And the two things you need to be good at are capturing and executing on business. That is what you need to be good at. Leave the lawyering as well as the accounting to other people because that's our wheelhouse and we're good at it and we can help you be successful if you'll let us. Drafting and negotiation. These are not contracts of adhesion. Just because some big business wants to do business with you and I'm talking about all these agreements now. NDAs, team agreements, subcontract agreements, joint venture agreements, point of purchase agreements. Be involved in this drafting or at least the negotiation process and if you don't know what you're doing, get somebody who does. Boundaries, 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 boundaries. Anybody ever read the book Boundaries? Great Christian psychology book came, what, 20 years ago, maybe? Marvelous book, relationship book. It's a brilliant book. It's a great book to read about how to have business relationships too. It's all about boundaries. Understand where you stop and they start and how it's all gonna work. Peel it back. Accountability tools. President Reagan's one-liner, trust but verify. Oh yeah, trust but verify. If you don't have accountability tools built into your agreements, guess what? You don't have accountability. And by the way, a standard without a consequence is a suggestion. That, by the way, that's one of Hawk's parenting philosophies. A standard without a consequence is a suggestion. One of the reasons I'm still not married anymore because she and I didn't see eye to eye on that. Um, protect your entity at all costs at all costs, because Ogie, OG, OG and 
and Fred. OG and Fred are good guys. But Fred's aim point is not to protect OG. OG's aim point is not to protect Fred. They need to protect themselves. And they're good guys, but good guys can be in disagreement about things. Good guys can have issues come up that is outside their control, but affects them both. And, and they need to protect their interests. And you need to protect your interests because you're the only one who's going to do that. Dispute resolution. We're gonna to get to more of that in a moment. People ask all the time, what is the most important provision in any legal agreement? And I will tell you as counsel, it is the dispute resolution provision. Because if you have an agreement you can't enforce, it's not worth the paper it's written on. If that big business that you're signing up to whatever with says, we're gonna litigate this in the Southern District of New York in federal court, you better hope they're honest. Because if there's not, there's nothing you can do about it. Southern District of New York, by the way, is Manhattan. So what our agreements say with our clients is, we're going to do alternative dispute resolution, we're going to do it in the jurisdiction where our client is located, and we're gonna cap on the number of lawyers who can be involved. <gasps> you can do that? Yeah, you can. You can negotiate anything you want in an agreement. And I recommend that you do, because if you can't enforce it, it's not worth the paper it's written on. That's exactly right. Okay, moving on. Dispute resolution. I love this tagline, and it is my own tagline. <laughs> the most important thing you need to know about resolving dispute is that tagline. You need to make sure you're the lead sled dog. If at all possible, be the lead sled dog, or at least write agreements to make it possible for you to have a change of view if things go south. The good news out of the, the regulatory body of, of law that informs dispute resolution in the federal market, those are great boots by the way, is that it is the express policy of the federal government when in dispute with a contractor and particularly a small business contractor to resolve disputes inexpensively and expeditiously, cheap and fast. Hey, that's good news. And that's, by the way, that's in the FAR, all right? That is good news for you. What I want to advise you is that you need to have that same attitude in your relationship with one another. Whether it's the big business upstream from you, it's the vendor downstream from you, it's the joint venture partner with you, Whoever it is, you want to have an approach to dispute resolution where Karen and Pamela can work out their differences. Because just like with our gentleman over here, good people can be in dispute. And what you want is an approach in all of your instruments that says, hey, let's see if we can sort this out informally among us. And if we can't, then let's go into a limited time of mediation followed by binding arbitration and we're gonna put this thing to bed and we're gonna move on. Because here's what I wanna tell you. I'll foot stomp on this one. When you are in small business, litigation is a loser, okay? You heard it from the lawyer's mouth, litigation is a loser. The only ones who are gonna win if you litigate anything is me, okay? I don't want to take your money that way. You know why? Because you're not going to love me afterwards. All you're gonna see is how much it costs you to save your business. You're gonna be glad you saved your business, but you're gonna curse me all the way down the street because it cost you so much to save your business. Let's not do that, shall we? Let's agree we're not going to do that. Let's agree we're going to do things well and faithfully and properly up front, informed by good legal counsel because everything we're doing has legal consequence to it and mitigate those risks so that the likelihood of us ever ending up in court together goes way down instead of way up. Fair? Great. And to give you just an anecdote of that, we just wrapped up a case in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims that lasted three years, the last year and a half of which was over legal fees, which cost $300,000 in legal fees to recover 135. And we couldn't get out of it because we were in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. And you can't just walk away from the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. And the judge wanted to see it through. So that's what we did. And our client spent not to litigate the underlying protest, which we won, 
but to litigate the legal fees with the Department of Justice to recover $135,000 cost our client $300,000 in additional legal fees that are non-recoverable. Litigation is a, the aim point as, well, all kinds of people have said it, but let's go to William Wallace and Braveheart. Our aim point, folks, is to live to fight another day. Whatever the problem is, perform. Because I will tell you, if you're in dispute with the federal government and you don't perform, you've now taken whatever this problem was that was this size, and now you made it a problem this size, okay? And when problems get big, legal fees go up exponentially. That's exactly right, okay? So keep performing for your customer, and what you want to do is to work out your issues, your disputes, your controversies as quickly and, excuse me, as, quickly and as cheaply as possible. And we have the tools to help you do that, but that's what you want to do. Whatever it is, don't get emotional about it. You got to cut your losses and move on because you got to live to fight another day because the government, especially in large businesses, they will bleed you out before you ever get a victory. That's just the way it is. Um, yeah, hire us now, not later. I've already talked about that. Uh, let me hit the third one. This is normally what I close my sessions on, but I'll throw it out here for you right now. If your lawyer thinks far is a long, long way, <laughs> you need a new lawyer. Okay, a bit of levity. Here's what I really wanna draw your attention to. You should commit that to memory. That's one of those things I should quiz anyone who's ever seen me talk about anything on the federal circuit because it's absolutely true. I want to guarantee you something and lawyers never guarantee anything except to take your money. <laughs> I want to guarantee you something. You are not the smartest, most clever, most wily, most creative federal contractor to ever walk the planet. You're not. Somebody who's smarter than you already tried whatever it is you're stirring around in your head thinking you're gonna do to sidestep the rules. And they got caught and they got hammered and they wish they hadn't. So don't. It's a whole lot easier to comply with the system than you think. It is a whole lot more risky to try to evade the system than you think. People think the worst thing that can happen to them in this business is that they're gonna lose their business. You're wrong. You can go to jail if you don't do this right. We had a client, I kid you not, true story. We had just been retained. I'm sitting with the CEO, immigrant, had a sixth grade education when he came to this country. By the time he retired from the army as a W-4, he had a master's degree. He was building a construction business. Most patriotic guy I've ever known in my life. He had just hired us. I was sitting down with him in his office when the phone rang and it was one of and construction. How many of you are just construction? Oh no, raise your hands high and proud. Okay, keep them up, keep them up. Everyone else, you look at those folks and say, bless your heart, I'm glad I'm not you either. <laughs> Construction is lawyer nirvana uh, because of employment law issues, labor law issues, ugh, and I don't even like that stuff. And they get regular progress payments, which means we don't have to about worry about retainers being replenished, okay? It's a beautiful thing. Um, but his phone rings and it's one of his project supervisors from another jurisdiction, because they covered about eight states, who said, hey, the OSI just called. They're coming out to pick me up for an interview. Is that a problem? And the CEO who has them on speaker looks at me and says, Hawk, I'm glad you're here. Is that a problem? And with everything in me, I didn't say, well, for you, it's a problem. For me, it's a business opportunity. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I wanted to really, really bad. Uh, fast forward three years, they were contractor, small business contractor of the year in that region. But what happened in the meantime was they were facing, in one case, a payroll clerk was facing roughly 350 counts, criminal indictment counts 
for false claims because she was certifying payroll to the contracting officer that was false. Anytime you see hammer, th and you guys in construction, y'all who are in construction, I use the guy term guy, gender neutral, thank you. Um, all this PC stuff. Uh, here's the deal. Anytime you got a hammer swinger who's logging eight a day, five days a week, like clockwork, something's not right there. And they got found out because they had a disgruntled former hammer swinger who thought he needed some overtime that he didn't get. And he raised the flag and it all started unwinding from there. It included a COO who was logging payments from the government as expenses into their QuickBooks, which is a great way to drive down your taxable income. <laughs> it's enormously illegal. Um, and it just went on and on and on from there. Um, ultimately, before they finally emerged years later as the small business contractor of the year, the stress of all of it got to the CEO and the man killed himself because he was facing life imprisonment as the owner of that business. The risks here are far greater than you realize. Don't take shortcuts. You are owners and executives of small businesses. You have a duty to lead, okay? And for those of you who are former military, especially, you have no excuse. You are still stewards of the public trust. And whether it's the American taxpayer or it's your own people, you have a duty to lead and be a good steward of what you've been given. This is the disclaimer that says, you can't rely on anything I said this morning. <laughs> Congratulations. And this is my contact info. But as I mentioned at the beginning, there are these, I don't know, what do you call these things? What is this called? I'm not a marketing person. What is this called? It's a trifold, except it's only a third of the trifold. Unifold. It's a what? Unifold. It's a unifold. There we have it. I learned a new word. There's a unifold, there's a card, and there's the super cool credit card size eight gig flash drive. Please come up, leave your card, Come talk to me if you have any questions. Thank you for having me and have an incredible conference.